Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paqua, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Tonight, we're going to be taking a look at a topic about the early 20th century in Mexico. This was a time that was very, very grim in regard to religious freedom. And the Cristero War had over 100,000 combatants killed, along with about a quarter of a million civilian deaths. Now, the church has recognized 38 martyr saints from the Cristero War, some canonized just as recently as three years ago. And our guest tonight is Monsignor James T. Murphy from the Diocese of Sacramento, California. He has written a wonderful book. I mean, I really found it very exciting to read this and extremely informative. It is called Saints and Sinners in the Cristero War, Stories of Martyrdom from Mexico. This uh, is a great topic, and we're very honored to have you. Monsignor, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Good to have you with us. And um, uh, as I said, th this is a, a very exciting book because you know, a lot of times we don't know enough about Mexican history. There have been some movies, I I'd say, I learned a lot of my history from movies like Pancho Villa and some movies about Benito Juarez and a, a few others. Uh, you hear about the Emperor Maximilian. And, and then at the end of our own civil war, that there was the, the threat that we might go and help Benito Juarez get rid of the um, Emperor of Mexico because of the Monroe Doctrine. And right. uh, so that, that little things, but there's not much known. And everybody knows how Catholic Mexico is. And it seems so weird that the government would start to persecute the church and do so with a real vicious quality, and it was just outright mean. How did this all come about? It's, it goes back to the colonial history of Mexico, yeah. which came to haunt us. In the colonial history of Mexico, uh, of course, the crown, all the uh, Spanish um, um, kings and queens were all Catholic, sincere Catholic. I think mm -hmm. they wanted the the, you know, the conversion of the Indians. So there was a partnership between the church and the state for 300 years, a partnership, the two majesties, they call them. And if you look at the average square in Mexico, in any town in Mexico, the square, central square, will have the, the church or cathedral on one side and the city hall on the other. That was a, it was a, a symbol of that partnership. As a result, the crown had privileges. They had a, a say in the appointment of bishops, uh, the building of churches, and so on. But in in response, they had to help with the conversion of the Indians. It was it was a partnership that was fine so long as they got on on speaking terms. At times, they didn't, and the church challenged them on certain things. The most famous example of that being the suppression of the Jesuits in 1767. In 1767, later in Europe, as you know, but they literally kicked them out, took all of their universities and property over and made them part of the state. It was a shocking move at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, all the alumni of those universities who had those favorite professors, they see them being kicked out. That happened. That came back to haunt the church later. When the church, uh, when, when the when, when Mexico got its freedom from Spain and was now a free state, uh, the church still had special privileges, but the radicals who got control, who were, who were affected by the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, 
right away said, why does the church have to have special privileges? And why can't we control the church in the same way that the crown controlled the Jesuits? And that's what haunted us. That's the, the origin of a problem which got worse, escalated, and ended up in the Cristero War. And in fact, w one of the points, uh, uh, being myself a Jesuit, uh, when right. I was back as a novice, I did one of my, hist the paper I did for the history of the society was on right. the suppression of the Jesuits. And what was key is that the prime ministers of France, Portugal, Correct. and Spain were Correct. all strongly in, uh, influenced by the Masonic Lodge and, had, and blamed Catholicism for right. the poverty of their countries. And yeah. they swayed their monarchs to oppose the Jesuits. But they were influenced not only by the Masonic laws, but also by the ideas of the French Revolution, that, that became the French Revolution 20 right. years before it happened. And this right. is, and this is uh, I think, a key factor in Mexico as well. Right. By the way, and I would just bring this up, I do think the movie Mission, which your order was directly involved in, poor, poor old Dan Berrigan, was involved in helping them to do that. I think it's an excellent movie. I think it's extremely sad. It's a sad movie, yes. but it's it gives you a window into this difficult problem. Mm -hmm. uh, sad. Well, and of course the Mar Mar the Marquis of Pombal. My God, the Marquis yes. of Pombal. He was vicious. Uh, he vicious. was vicious. Yep. Now, one of the, the the things that happens in the 1800s is that Mexico got its independence from Spain. That was what right. 1810. Right. It yeah. began in 1810, finally got it in 1820. Okay. And at first it was a Catholic movement. I mean, the uh, Hidalgo and his, his troops were led by Lady Guadalupe, but eventually the radicals took over mm -hmm. and then they turned to the church. So what happened was a partnership between church and state, which was great for 300 years, now ended up being the very opposite, enmity. Yes. It, was the, it went the other way. The it, the, it went to the other extreme. And like it did in France. And one of the things that you also bring out is that people like Benito Juarez, who was trying to get rid of the French and the, yes. the Austrian emperor, because it, yes. it was uh, an Austrian that became the emperor yeah. for, uh, for the Maximilian. Okay. Oh, and correct. he was originally very Catholic himself, but he correct. turned because correct. of this French Revolution ideology. Correct. Well, what happened too was, we have to say this, I think, in honesty, the bishops, it's, it's, it's painful to read, the bishops did make mistakes. Um, the bishops were so concerned about this radical, atheistic philosophy invading Mexico that they went the other way. But in, as a result, they ended up uh, being against Mexican independence. And they were in favor of that harebrained idea to bring in this Austrian Duke to become the emperor of Mexico, which is a totally a disaster. And the, the credibility of the church paid a heavy price for that. Yep. Yeah, this is, um, you know, something that has to be very cautious about hitching any church wagon to right. a political mule. Correct. You know, the, it, Absolutely. It, you don't know yeah. where it's going to go. Now, right. However, you yeah. know, there was a revival in the next century. We may get to that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Come get, bring us to that part. So under Juarez, yeah. he, the, the church sided with the emperor. The emperor lost out and is uh, executed. Right. And there's anti-church feeling. But you bring in the importance of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Right. Yeah. Tell us about so, his role. So in the 19th century, the church was on the wrong side of history. No question about that. They made huge mistakes. However, uh, Pope um, uh, Leo put out the famous encyclical Rerum Novarum, for which he is most famous, in 1891. That encyclical caught on big time in Mexico, big mm -hmm. time. Uh, it is, as you know, the encyclical about um, justice, social justice for the poor. And uh, it was in a response to Marxism, the point being they don't have to become Marxists to find justice, use Christian principles 
to bring justice to workers in the world. So it's a very strong encyclical on the rights of workers to unionize, to have a, a just wage, to have insurance and so on. That caught on big time in Mexico. And there was a whole movement um, of social justice groups. Um, Catholic unions sprung up. They had they had these big conferences. The Diet of Zamora was one famous one then, which was a conglomeration of the, the pre-existing groups. It was a huge movement. And the famous ACJM, uh, Asociación Católica de Juventud Mexicana, the Association of, of, of Mexican Youth, a powerful organization, was founded by the Jesuits, by the way, was founded at that time. That was a key player in the Cristero War. This all happened. However, the gen and at that point, ironically, the social agenda of the Catholic Church was quite close to the social agenda of the of, of the uh, generals. It was the, they were both calling for the same thing: justice for workers, unionization, uh, the end of of labor for women and children, and so on. But the the, the generals, the revolutionary generals, were so anti-Catholic by that point, and the polarization was so bad that they dismissed. The Catholic agenda as phony. They just kept repeating the same old jargon that the Catholic Church is against progress, it's for the rich, and so on. And, and they actually crushed the Catholic Union movement. It's a sad chapter yeah. in a, a missed opportunity. Yep. And it's um, this is something that uh, I, I think we don't always appreciate how important an impact. Pope Leo's encyclical, Rem Navarum, had. Uh, I, one of the things I was doing a, a study of the social encyclicals uh, some years ago at a seminary, uh -huh. and uh, I, I was the teacher, and there's nothing like teaching to learn something. Of course. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed is that there had been strong papal teaching condemning slavery and the slave trade. The yes. last encyclical on that topic was by Leo the Thirteenth, so yes. it had been going on for 450 years of teaching right. against it, and then once the last Christian country ended slavery, which was the Empire of Brazil, that was when he switched over to labor movement. So the, yes. the, this was part of a long tradition, and. Yes. It just is that a lot of times Catholics didn't understand that social teaching and its ramifications. And if right. we don't, how is the world going to understand it? Right. And all the heroes in this story, all the heroes in this story were all enthusiasts of Rero Navarum, including Archbishop Orozco, especially Miguel Pro. Miguel Pro, his dad was a manager of mines you know, silver mines in, in Zacatecas. And he saw close up the horrible conditions that, 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 that workers worked under in those mines. So when he studied Rero Navarum in the seminary, he had the experience from his youth of exactly how much it was needed. And also, um, all of them. And Ateta Gonzalez Flores was big on it, that encyclical, and so was Tribio Romo. They were all inspired by this encyclical. Now, what is it that happened uh, in you know the 1910 through 1917? Because you start to see a change uh, in the attitude yeah. toward the church as a new constitution comes about. Right. Well, see, we had originally the first constitution in 1857 led to a horrible war, the war uh, of, of the reform, very bitter war, when they reenacted. The, um, the, the, the scenes of the French Revolution. Then Porfirio Diaz took over. He was a dictator, and he was he was dictator for like 25 years. During that time, there was peace. It, it, he was a dictator, but there was peace. But when he was overthrown in 1810 by Francisco Madero, that opened up the whole thing again. And so the anti-clericalism that was under the surface for 25 years came back to the surface. And at this time, there was a revolution and um, Madero was overthrown, 
And then this horrible period of Mexican history unfolded, called the War of the Generals, the War of the Generals, when five or six generals fought each other to get control of the nation. And it was just mayhem with the people suffering on the sidelines. Yep. It is said that between 1910 and 1920, between one and a half and two million people were, lost their lives um, out of a population of 15 million. And for every general or famous name, you mentioned them, who was killed, 100,000 innocent people were killed. For example, two or three months of hard work in the blazing sun, uh, sowing your, 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 your um, beans could be wiped out in five minutes by 5,000 cavalry stomping over the, the, the field. And then they would probably stop at the poor little guy's house and take the milk cow and the turkey they had for, for food. Yep. This is- Terrible uh, suffering, terrible suffering. You know, it reminds me of the, the kind of collapse in the early 200s where Roman generals had gone through a series of wars against each other and it just destroyed the fiber of the empire. And it right. sounds like this was going on in Mexico as well. Right. Jean Mayer, by the way, compares Calles to the Diocletian, the, the, uh, the, uh, the emperor. Yes. He said they were both brilliant, both brilliant statesmen, both brilliantly intelligent, both, both very self-controlled, but both had an obsession about Christianity, the emperor and Calles. Yeah, the, yeah the, the emperor Diocletian uh, had the last but the most vicious perse Roman persecution of the church. And right. Plutarco El Elias Calles, president right. of Mexico, also right. had a worse persecution than had gone on in the time of Juarez. Right. We can get into that if you want. But he was, the guys before him were bad, but he was 10 times worse. He was really bad. Yes. You mentioned this is the 1970 Constitution. That's, that's the key, a very, very key event. Um, so the War of the Generals finally ended when Carranza uh, won one over the other. So he was now president, Carranza, a general. And then he called a constitution uh, in Carretero to redo the 1857 Constitution. That constitution was just terribly pure anti-Catholic, anti-Catholic did several things, but the worst thing it did was, it said that Catholic Church doesn't have an existence of any kind in the eyes of the law. It's just not an organization in any way, shape or form, so it can't hold property. And so they just appropriated all the property. And it said, and it said that the, the legislatures have the power to control the number of priests in each state. In other words, priests would have to apply for a license, just like doctors and dentists and lawyers. And that gave them the power to control the number of priests. In other words, in a diocese, the controlling power was the legislature and the governor, not the bishop. Right. Now, that's what led ultimately to the Christian War, too. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that... Um again, we cannot underestimate. It, it would be the same year that the Bolsheviks take over in Russia. They right. write their constitution guaranteeing freedom of worship, but not freedom of religion. Right. And that meant the state had control of the church in right. Soviet Union as well as in Mexico. It's an interesting parallel between the two and the persecution of the church right. in both places. And let me pick up on that parallel. When the Americans became aware of the persecution of the church in Mexico, and people like Archbishop Curley of Baltimore, a very outspoken bishop, and the Knights of Columbus, they became aware of it. One of their points was, to, to, to Calvin Coolidge, they said, you are recognizing uh, the president of Mexico, and you don't recognize the one in Russia, and they're both equally bad. If you refuse to recognize Russia, why are you recognizing Mexico? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so 1917, the, the limits are placed on the church. The church is under the control of each state. Correct. 
so that the, the states licensed the priest. Everything right. depended on the governor of that state then. Correct. Correct. You see, it was a way to control the church. They wanted to find a way, and they found that legal way to do it. Um, and that, of course, immediately became a huge issue um, for the bishops, for everybody. And at Letha Gonzalez Flores, uh, that's what, what fired him up. His, he organized immediately, organized a boycott in Jalisco, the state of Jalisco, against the Constitution and against that provision. And he literally paralyzed the economy of Jalisco in about three or four months, to the point where they actually had to back off. The legislature in, in Guadalajara backed off because he was so successful. Well, tell, us, tried, a little, that, tell us a little bit about his background. Who is this guy? Well, Anacleto was a former seminarian for Guadalajara who left in, um, you know, before theology and philosophy, he left. Uh, he was a very saintly, very saintly man. We went to Guadalajara, he studied law, became a lawyer, but lived in a community. He gathered a community around him of men who shared, you know, um, it's almost like St. Ignatius, shared their common life and shared their prayer life together, but were also open to the local community and were a huge force. He, they took on this issue, and he organized that boycott, and he used the ACJM, that youth movement, which the Jesuits had founded, he, they were highly organized and highly enthusiastic, highly active. He used their help in organizing it. It was highly successful. He also admired Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, and Dan Daniel O'Connell from Ireland, who was one of the uh, nonviolent people in Ireland in the, 19, in, the, in the 20th century. But he was highly successful, and the government had to back off. He was eventually, of course, captured, and he was tortured in that famous Cuarto Colorado in, in Guadalajara. It's the, it was the police headquarters, now a museum. He was tortured for a whole day. My God, they hung him by his thumbs. They, they punctured his lungs. They, uh, and then they took, they skimmed the, 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 the skin off his feet and made him walk across, uh, uh, you know, a, a gravel yard in the station there. And then they shot him. Yeah. His funeral was huge. His funeral had thousands of people. Yeah. You, he was well known. He was called the Maestro, El Maestro. He was so well known. He yeah. was a brilliant speaker, a brilliant writer, a brilliant lawyer. Yeah. He's yeah. under his his case for canonization is going in the process. Yeah, he he's already been beatified. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, yeah I think he's been beatified, he, but not he's, yet he's a, canonized. He's a, a shoe in. There's no question. He was yeah. a very saint, very saintly man. I have huge admiration for him. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, we, again, we think about this. Uh, one of the battle cries of the Enlightenment age was that the religion was the biggest cause of war in history. That was something yes. that went back to the 1650s. And right. they just kept repeating it, repeating it, and repeating it. But... In reality, they ended up becoming more vicious than what they had opposed. Of course. Just like course. the French revolutionaries under Robespierre and right. also like the Bolsheviks in, in Russia, that they right. became ever increasingly vicious to, to the church. Right. In the name of stopping what they claimed was the viciousness by the church. Right. And they, um, they became what they opposed. Correct. But see, what happened also was um, the intellectuals who became um, interested in and, and influenced by the French Revolution, some of them went to, to Europe and studied there. They, you know, they just accepted the, the French revolutionary radical thing that, that religion is a waste of time. Pure, yep. At the best, it's a waste of time. At the worst, it's a problem. And so people like Melchor Ocampo, who was involved in the 1857 Constitution, a friend of Paris, he just said religion is at the root of all Mexican problems. It's at the root of all our problems. And then he, there was a big debate that went on between him and a, a bishop about the whole thing in the press. But he said, he said, um, he said, uh, he said, uh, poor, poor Indians, your, your wealth is going up in smoke, the smoke of the candles 
and the in and the incense and the fireworks. He was saying that the whole thing was a waste of time, yep. and the root of all problems. Yep. And again, in the name of opposing that, and and again, we want to be very clear: there were abusive people inside the church. That, oh, the church made huge mistakes. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. There, there were huge. individuals whose sinfulness was an obstacle, and yep. there were also ideological problems, like you mentioned about the bishops supporting the Emperor Maximilian, that yep. these, were, these were mistakes, and, they were. And, and sometimes grave sins on the parts of some. But yep. the, even when those abuses ended, their opposition to the church continued on with this violent streak. Right, uh, because, I mean, the, as I said, the irony is that uh, as a result of Rerum Novarum, the social agenda of the church in the 1920s was just as liberal as the government. I mean, they, what a lost opportunity. They should have got together the two sides. Sure. And the bishops wanted, bishops wanted to, but the generals were so anti-clerical and threatened by the church that there was no way they would give the church credit for anything. Yeah. And they just yeah. refused to think. What they, they, they suppressed the union movement. They suppressed them. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the um, horrib horrible ironies. Well, so let's then continue on with this episode because this Constitution of 1917 leads to the government, you know, clamping down and trying to control the church. Right. And then we see uh, that it, it just, the, the agitation and problems get worse and worse. Right. Well, the people were just totally and utterly shocked. You, you can imagine, suddenly, on the, on the 31st of July, the uh, 26, the church is closed. There was no priest, there's no mass, there's no weddings, there's no sick calls, there was nothing. There was no bells every hour from the square. The entire thing is shut down. And the people were shocked out of their lives, but they didn't blame the bishops. They saw right away, this is Cayez. This, this is the guy we have as, as, um, as president. And it was one thing, see, the ordinary simple people didn't understand the niceties of the legal issues in the 1970 Constitution. They didn't understand it. They did understand this. This was their priest for Sunday Mass was taken away. And so what happened was um, that's what caused the spontaneous uh, rebellions. Uh, you know, they just spontaneously rebelled against it, and that led to the Cristero War. Yeah. See, that's, uh, and it was the bishops who ordered the closing of yes. the churches. Well, bishops said it, right. And, and because they saw this is hopeless. They, they, yeah, they can't do anything else but close everything right. down. It was, it was a protest. But you know what's funny? What's funny is Cayes and his people were immediately elated. They were elated. Uh, Cayes says, okay, good. Every week that these churches stay closed, they will lose 2% of their population in church. They'll lose 2% of church attendance. That's what he said. And then Tejeda, his minister of the interior said, he said, we have the clergy by the truth. We are going to strangle them. Well, they were dead wrong. What, what, just, what this did was make the make the, the make them more Catholic. Yep, yep. Now, and the, how? I, I don't want to get into how the um, eruption led because we have to take a break in just a couple of minutes. But right. uh, it did lead eventually to the bishops getting expelled from the country. Were they not? Right. Um, uh, we had um, one of the generals uh, in the Cristero army was a priest, uh, Jose Vega. And um, he, against the orders of his bishop, the priests were not allowed to, to pick up the gun and kill people. They could, you know, support the Cristeros by the sacraments and moral support, but they couldn't fight. But this guy joined the army, joined the Cristeros, and became a, a, a soldier. He got, he, he got promoted in the ranks became a general, and a very good general. He was called, they, they called him um, Pancho Villa in a cassock. Yeah. Anyway, he, a famous thing he did was, the most infamous thing he did, 
he attacked his troops, attacked um, a military train going from Guadalajara to Mexico City. Uh, and he just ripped up the tracks, and that stopped them in their tracks. And then, they, of course, the fire from the military in the train, he, he returned the fire. 150 people were killed. He burned the train. 150 people were killed. 50 of them were civilians. That, that, that reached the press of the world. It was a huge scandal that a Roman Catholic priest would have done that. That gave the government another excuse. They said, see, we told you. This is what we all been saying. The priests are behind this whole thing. The priests are the ones behind this rebellion. And so they banished the priests from the country. They were put on a train, put to the border, and they ended up going to San Antonio, Texas. And the bishops were meeting in San Antonio, Texas from then out until 29, three years. That's where they met. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, And uh, it was in this period, I believe, that uh, with the priests and seminarians being kicked out of the country that... Um, yeah. Uh, Miguel Pro uh, went up to California and did his studies. Right. He did. Uh, he joined them. He was in the seminary in Zamora, and they were, of course, terribly worried about the whole future of of, uh, of the seminary and the, it was going so bad. The War of the Generals. So yes, he he, he they sent them all up. There's 13 of them. They sent them up to Los Gatos. In Los Gatos, they had no space because they had their it was full. But they had the top floor. They just did up the top floor, and the guys were up there. But there was no Spanish books in the library. There was nothing. So it wasn't a very easy year for him. But after a year, they were all sent to Spain, to Granada. And that's where he did his seminary studies, then in Belgium. And then he was ordained over there in Belgium. He came back to Mexico then, Miguel Pro did, and came back in the middle of it. He came back in June of 1926. That was just as the thing was heating up when Calles had passed the famous Calles Law, which I can get into if you want. Yeah, well, let's get into it after the break, uh, okay. because um, th this is, again, a, an, ex uh, an exciting period of history of our Catholic neighbor, Mexico, and it's something that I think is relevant for us. So stay with us. We'll continue on the story of how the Mexican government persecuted the church and how the people of Mexico rebelled against that persecution. Stay with us. All right, we are now talking to Monsignor James T. Murphy about his book called Saints and Sinners in the Cristero War, Stories of Martyrdom from Mexico. Uh, again, you can get this book at EWTNRC.com. It's item number 2626. So it's, uh, I, I like Monsignor Murphy's book very much. Um, but let's continue talking about this uh, uh, event. Um, you know, you mentioned the priest Vega, who they called the Pancho Villa in a cassock. He was a, <laughs> a general, and he, he was very successful. Eventually, he was killed. Um, Correct. Uh, but he uh, was able to go to confession before his, um, uh, he finally yes. died, died. Right. Yeah. Apparently yeah. he needed that confession. He hadn't been such a good guy. He did. He yeah. did. That's the thing. It's a difficult, he's a difficult character to, to deal with because you feel ambivalent about him. Yeah. I'll explain that. He, you know, he did, of course, disobey his bishop. 
He did pick up a gun. He did fight. He killed people. In fact, he sometimes he executed some prisoners he shouldn't have executed. He was yeah. also loose. He was also loose with women. But you know, think about it this way: How many of the priests sat on their hands, or sat on the sidelines, or went and uh, and lived with their rich friends and and waited this thing out? At least this poor guy went out and fought for the faith and fought for for freedom of religion. And you know, the interesting thing about this is, on the day in which Miguel Pro was being executed in Mexico City. The guy, the, the chief of police was a man called Cruz. Cruz. That evening, Cruz had a priest at his house for dinner. Huh. While Miguel Pro was being executed at the headquarters, he had a priest for dinner that evening. So you had guys who just sat it out, and some of them even criticized the Cristeros. So, you know, as regards um, Vega, I. Yeah, I think God will forgive him. I just do. Yeah. He'd never make it through canonization, of course, but... No, 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 no. no. He's not that kind of a, a that exemplary kind of a... model at all. But, Correct. you know, he, was, he had enough faith to be able to repent uh, he before he died and, and ask God's mercy. Right. A lot of us need that. Now, Correct. one... But there was a, another general, uh, he had been in the military, and the Cristeros convinced him to join them as well. To take over. Right. To take over. Right. right. See, they, they were terribly untrained, and they couldn't, they didn't, didn't know how to conserve their ammunition, and they were, it was like shooting pigeons, one general said. So they finally, an inspired decision, they asked this guy, Enrique Goros Tieta, to take over. He was a general, he was a professional soldier, and he was a, the youngest general in the history of Mexico during the War of the Generals. But in the War of the Generals, he ended up being on the wrong side. And so he left in 1917 or 16, left, and he was in self-exile in Cuba for a while. He then came back and got a job he didn't very much enjoy. So he was basically bored with life and um, itching to get back into some kind of military thing. So the, the, the League, which controlled the, the uh, Cristeros, asked him to take over the Cristero movement. And so he did. And he was absolutely stunned by, this, by the, 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 the enthusiasm, the morale of these country, these rural Catholics, and the courage that they had. And they were throwing themselves at the enemy, you know, unnecessarily. So he took them over, and he honed their skills. And he did beat them into a fairly decent working force. I mean, there was 50,000 of them in the field in the end. But even at that late stage, at the best, at its peak, those 50,000 fighters, only about half of them were organized in, in brigades and regiments with proper officers. And even among the officers, not, you know, only a few of them were, were professional soldiers from the days of the, the War of the Generals. Most of them were just well-meaning guys who picked up the technique and learn from Goro's Theater, but their success was amazing. They held off the government for 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 three years. Yep. And they took over, by the way, they took over whole regions of, of Jalisco and 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 uh, Guanajuato, and they set up their own government. It was like a, it was like a separate state within a state. It's their own government with their own school system, their own legal system, their own taxation system. It was amazing. Yeah. But they did. And this uh, I think also to so folks understand, these were mostly uh, people who were peasants. Correct. Often did not own their own land. They worked for somebody else. They didn't have barely subsistence in Correct. the best of times. But Correct. But their faith was so important, more important than what the government would try to offer them and they stood up against the government when the government of Mexico opposed the faith. Right. They, it was a movement, more than a, a military campaign. It was a movement where, for the government, the government soldiers didn't have that kind of morale. In many ways, the government soldiers didn't believe in the cause. I mean, they were, they were killing their own citizens, and they were Catholics, a lot of them. So they didn't... Uh, they, they would low morale. There's a huge... Um, you know, rate of the government people dropping out. So they had high morale, but they had so little by way of um, 
you know, uh, ammunition. There was a constant need for ammunition. And um, disorganized, and uh, it was amazing. Yep. But they did have the support of the population, and they, 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 and they conducted a guerrilla warfare, which meant that you hit, you hit and run, and, and see Goros Theatha train them. He said, you only fight the enemy on your terms, not theirs. You do it when, when it's advantageous to you, then you withdraw and take into the mountains where they can't get you. And the, the government forces were not geared for guerrilla warfare. Another point that you bring out in all this is the role of the women in this Cristero war. They had yeah. extremely important uh, role in this and, some, and their own officers and such. Right. A amazing. It's my favorite anecdote or part of that entire story. What they did was the women organized themselves into an organization called the Women's Brigade on military lines. It was all done in military lines with officers all the way to the top. And it was about four of them who were generals. They were all young, between 15 and 25 seamstresses and shop girls and nurses and secretaries, just simple people who joined up. It was secret, and the thing was kept so well, the secrecy, the government didn't even know they existed until the end. Um, the, 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 the generals, there wasn't a single one of them over 35. They were incredible. What they did mainly was get ammunition for the troops, because there was a constant need for ammunition. And the United States government had a policy they would not give any help to a rebel movement. So they recognized the official government of Cayez and would not allow any help to go towards them. So what they would do is they would bribe the, gen the, 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 the generals who were corrupt to get ammunition to buy it, or they would talk, they would uh, convince the wives of those generals who were Catholic, the wives of the generals to join the cause. And these wives were undoing at night what their husbands were doing during the day. <laughs> these, these government generals, it was a riot. But then I don't think you'll were... find too much argument from a number of married men. You know, they'll, they'll understand that ladies have a way of getting things done, you know, despite their husbands. Darn right, darn right, good for them. And um, then they would send the ammunition up to the up to the uh, the battlefield, um, hidden in like um, loads of cement or under a, a load of maize or coal or something. And then they would also carry it personally. They had these shirts made, which they wore under their dresses, these women. They had special shirts with huge pockets in them. And they'd fill those pockets with bullets. And they were weighed down with this lead. And that they went to the, out to the battlefields doing that. Now, the generals in the Cristero War will te would tell you that they could not have gotten on without them. They couldn't have gotten on without the, 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 the famous... Uh, women's Brigade. The the sad thing about it is there was very little written about them um, because they were secret and there were no records. Yep. We just don't know. And, and a lot of times, you know, this is one of the keys in the military. You have to keep secrets in the military because yep. your enemy will use knowledge against you. You know, and that's yes. very important. Um, oh, yeah. You know, there, there was a, a story I just read today that a, a, a really ignoramus uh, senator back in World War II said, our submarines are so good now they can go to depths of 350 feet, whereas the yeah. Japanese were only letting the depth charges to 150, so we were yeah. escaping. Once he made that public in a yeah, stupid uh, boast, of course, then... Of course. Uh, the the Japanese course. started sinking our submarines. Now, this is um, there's, there's another element here that I want to bring up. The Knights of Columbus did mm -hmm. help the Cristeros. They gave about a million dollars to the Cristeros, whereas on the other side, the Ku Klux Klan Correct. heard about that, and they donated $10 million dollars the Cayes, because right. the Klan was very anti-Catholic. Of course, absolutely. Um, yes, uh, see, it's well to keep in mind that that the 
the American Catholic press were keeping an eye on this thing for years. They had been watching it. And the diocesan newspapers, I, I was editor of our paper here. I went back and looked at the old issues. There's all, you can see all kinds of coverage in the Catholic Herald, and all of them, all the dioceses, plus Commonweal, American Magazine, they all were doing constant coverage of this. So they were aware of it. But that awareness was uh, very much by the Calles Law. And what the Calles Law is, um, the 1970 Constitution was was terribly anti-Catholic, draconian, to the point where it was impractical to implement. It was just ridiculously impractical to implement it. So governors ignored it. They turned a blind eye. For one thing, their kids were in Catholic schools. What would they do if they closed the schools? Where would the kids go? Uh, so the whole thing was impractical. So they basically turned a blind eye to it until Calles came into power in 1924 the first thing Caius did was say, I want the Constitution literally read and implemented. And he put out a law that said that every priest must register immediately, register with the government. And the legislature must control the number of priests in each state. And he put, th there were penalties for the governor or the, or the Catholic, and for whoever didn't obey the law, there were penalties. That set off alarm bells everywhere, including in the United States. Walter Lippmann, the famous journalist, uh, author, and columnist, said this is an invitation for war. He was shocked, and everybody was shocked. That got them going in the States. So people like Archbishop Curley of, of, of Baltimore, Michael Curley, started giving off hell. And the Knights of Columbus began to speak up. And that put pressure on Calvin Coolidge and Flaherty, the head of the Knights of Columbus met with Coolidge. Coolidge had to meet with them. But yes, they raised a million dollars, the Knights did, to help all the priests and sisters who were refugees from this. Plus, the bishops were meeting in San Antonio, Texas, not Mexico City. And this is, uh, so folks also understand that priests were no under this law. They could not wear any sign that they were a priest, no clerical garb. There was a sure. fine of 250 U.S. dollars, well, you know, yeah. 500 uh, pesos. Uh, and if a priest criticized the government, he would go to prison for five years. Right. And these were well, was, uh, really very, very serious issues. Oh, well, very serious. And I mean, the bishops realized, I mean, this is serious. I mean, they, if the government was controlling the priests, not the bishop, my God, how could you not object? And that's why they suspended worship. It was a very radical thing to do. Yep. It's what we call today, we call this today in politics, the nuclear option. Yep. You know, will we suspend worship? And there was a big debate about that at the bishop's conference. And the Archbishop of Guadalajara, um, um, uh, Francisco Orozco. Orozco, was very wary about doing it. He said, my God, if we do this, will the people ever come back to church? And But anyway, they did it. They finally did it, and that led to the Cristero War. Yep, yep. And um, we see... We can talk about Orozco. Want to talk uh, about Orozco? Yeah, that, uh, yeah let's, we have about eight minutes left. Tell us about uh, Archbishop Orozco. Orozco was the Archbishop of Guadalajara, and, you know, they should, they should make a movie about him. I mean, <laughs> Hollywood. He's just an interesting, an interesting character. He was banished from the diocese five times. Cinco five times. And at one period, he ran the archdiocese hiding. He went up into hiding up in the hills outside of near, near Tequila and ran the diocese from hiding. He had an Indian guy who would come down to the city every week and bring the letters to the priests and the letters back from the priest to the bishop. And he would go from, uh, you know, home to home, uh, parish to parish, just doing baptisms, doing masses, but on the run. And the government had a price on his head, but they couldn't catch him. They just, yeah. it was like Miguel Pro. They couldn't catch him. There's a story told about him. Uh, one day he was riding horseback, going to a parish, and they had a priest with him. The two of them were riding in the countryside on this trail. And the next thing, the federal troops show up. And the priest said to him, look, can I, do I have to do, like, let me do what I have to do. And he says, okay. So the priest, they were both in disguise. And the bishop was, had a big black beard, a big fuzzy beard, and a big 10-gallon hat and old ranchero clothes on, the priest as well. So the priest, he pretended he was a, a ranch fella, and he says, he, he says to the bishop, round up those cows, go, go, round up those cows. 
So the bishop goes down into the field on his horse and tries to round up the cows. He doesn't have a clue how to do it. So the priest says, oh, you are such a pain in the butt. I, I, how do I put up with you? The soldiers fell for the story. And one of them says to the priest, he says, by the way, he says, we're looking for the Archbishop of Guadalajara, Francisco Orozco. Do you know where he might be? And the priest says, oh, he says, I just left San Francisco 20 minutes ago, and he's there. Go hurry up and you'll find him. And they took off. He was amazing. One, yeah. night he was in, one night he was in this home. He would stay in the homes of the poor Indians because it was harder to find them. The government wouldn't find them there. And he's in this home of these Indians, and it's a dirt floor in his bedroom, and he's got candlelight, and he's saying his office. He's saying Vespers or Compline or something. And the next thing he sees, a snake crawling over his feet. And he just stays dead silent. He stays quiet until the unwelcome visitor passed on. So it, was, it wasn't easy for him. He was, um, oh. the food was simple and the clothes were difficult to wear and it was hot and 10 gallon hat, he wasn't used to it. And anyway, he, he, and you know what he did? He would have all these masses. One of the things he did was he had ordinations. When, when, they, when the ordination time came around that year, he had an open air mass in secret up in the hills. He ordained 17 priests. He ordained 16 deacons, and he gave minor orders to 53 seminarians in an open air secret mass up in the hills. And he had uh, sentries posted, the seminarians, to watch out. And actually that day, the troops did show up in the distance and they had to, at the end of mass. So that they had to bring the end of the mass to an end fast and scatter before they got caught. Yep. See, these, this is the, the kind of thing that, um, ironically, the government wanted the church to reform, but the reform looked like Archbishop Orozco, that yes, this, this kind of heroism and right. courage and right. getting out there and being with the folks more was probably yeah. not what they had in mind, but that was the reform yeah. of the church. Right. Uh, and of course, he was the one that the government feared most because he was so articulate, so articulate and so respected. We may not have time to do this, but at the, in the settlement at the end, when they settled the war and they met with the government, one of the government's stipulation was, we want Archbishop Orozco of Guadalajara banished before we will agree to anything. They insisted on him being banished. So he was a sacrificial lamb in the final arrangement, even though Orozco preached nonviolence from the get-go. Yeah. Totally nonviolence. But, but ultimately, it, it sounds as if they were more afraid of a reformed and energetic evangelical yes. Catholic Church Yes. than they were of the corrupt stuff or the, the not so much even just corrupt, but guys who were sort of everything Correct. as usual. You know, Correct. that's uh, easier yes. to than, deal more, with. More than that, they were threatened by it. See, that's why when the, when the church came up with this social agenda based on Rerum Navarum, which was just as liberal as the government, they refused to cooperate and join forces. Right. They crushed the Catholic unions, because they were threatened by it. They were threatened. Yeah, yeah this is um, something for all of us to learn in these days, that as we are more committed as priests to our Catholic faith and our Catholic social teaching and see the two that I don't sacrifice the faith for social teaching, nor do I sacrifice social teaching for the faith, but I see the, the unity of Catholic thought and Catholic truth. Right. This, is, this is the way for us to go in the future. I want to just recommend again to our viewers your book. Uh, it's called Saints and Sinners in the Cristero War, Stories of Martyrdom from Mexico by Monsignor James T. Murphy. Again, you get an EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. Item 2626. I just want to conclude. We have just a minute left, but I just want to mention, you don't whitewash the Catholics or the government. You lay out the sins of both sides, and I appreciate that right. very much. Right. 
Would you join me in giving our audience a blessing? May Almighty, okay. may Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, the Son. and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Monsignor, thank you, thank you for being with us. And I, we want to thank our audience because you have been so helpful in all of these times of the COVID crisis by continuing to make it possible to bring such guests. Keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll keep on work doing our work. Thank you.